greatest common denominator? The greatest common denominator is the largest number that will go into a pair of numbers. Or if that's what I meant. Well, it's denominator, yeah, factor. The greatest common factor is the largest number that will go into two numbers. The least common multiple is the, lar the smallest number that those two numbers will go into. So it's kind of like, let me make it a little. If you have, you have number one and number two, they both go into the GCF. If you have, you know, um, no, they don't go into the GCF. They go into, the GCF goes into them. I'm going backwards, sorry. Goes into them. And if you have the same numbers, one and two, they go into the LCM. Okay, so it goes, they're backwards concept. So the least common multiple is the smallest natural number that is divisible by the numbers <coughs> that you're talking about. So the smallest number that those numbers will go into. <clears throat> okay. Um, we have the recommendation here. And then I'm going to actually go over this. So you don't have to write this part down and unless you want to. I'll come back to it if you want to write it down. But... We're going to do the factorization, the prime factors of each number. We're going to match again. And then you have to take one of each of the matching pairs and one of the non-matching. So I'll show you what I mean in just a second. Here's what we do. We're going to factor 144 and 300. Okay, and actually we just did this. So 144 is 12 times 12, which is 2 times 6, and 6 is 2 times 3. Uh, 300, I could do 30 and 10, which gives me 3 and 10, and 2 and 5, and 2 and 5. Okay, so to find the least common multiple, I'm going to take every matching pair. Okay, and I'm going to write them down. So we're going to use a bunch of different colors here. Okay, and now in 144, I have a 2 a 2 and a 3 left. And in 300, I have a 5 and a 5 left. Each pair that matches, you write down one, not both, but just one number for each of those pairs, and then you write down everything that's left over. And that will give you your least common multiple. What's happening here is you're taking these out, you don't need them in there twice. If you put them in there twice, it's a multiple, but it's not the least multiple. If you put them in there only once, it accounts for one set from each, both numbers basically, and then whatever's left over. So I have one, two, three, four twos, two threes, and two fives. So, The least common multiple of 144 and 300 is going to be 3,600. <clears throat> um, 66 is 2 times 33, and that's 3 times 11. And 90 is 2 times 45, which is 5 times 9, which is 3 times 3. Okay, I have a pair of twos. I have a pair of threes. Okay, so I'm going to count that two, 
that 3, so from here I take 1, 2, and I take 1, 3. Then I have an 11, a 5, and another 3. So these are from the pairs. This is like the leftovers. <clears throat> so I have 2 times 3 times 3 times 5 times 11. Um, yeah, I mean, does anybody want to see B before they try C? Or you guys want to try them? Want to see? Okay. <clears throat> so we'll do, uh, and doesn't factor into anything. 5 and 5. Um, 70 is 2 times 35, which is um, 7 times 5. The only thing we have in common is a 5. So I'm going to do a 5 from the pair that's in common, and then a 5, a 2, and a 7 that's left over. And so I have 25 times 14, so 350. Least common multiple and greatest common factor are actually things that you can apply in real world sort of situations. Um, this is sort of a not very useful real world application, but it's just like as you know, an example bump. So <clears throat> a movie theater runs its films continuously. One runs for 80 minutes and a second runs for 120 minutes. If they both start at four, when will they start at the same time again? Okay. Now this is movie times, but um, you can use this for if you want to buy stuff to make gift bags and you want to put like five gumballs in the gift bag and seven noisemakers in each gift bag or something. You know what I mean? Then you can figure out how many total gumballs and noisemakers you have to buy to put to make even number of gift bags, things like that. <coughs> so we've got Here's like the basic idea of the problem is we're going to start at 4 p.m. Okay. And then 80 minutes, that's an hour and 20 minutes later, the next movie will start. And then 120 minutes, that's two hours later, is when that movie will start again. And then you go an hour and 20 minutes later, so you get 6.40, 8 p.m., etc. And we want to find out when are these two times going to match. Um, so we have to find the least common multiple of 80 and 120 to know how many minutes after 4 o'clock they'll start. Well, 80 is 2 times 40. 120 is 3 times 40. You could actually stop here because the 40 matches in both. That's the greatest common factor of the two. I'm going to go ahead and continue though, just in case like you were doing this and you don't see that, so you know how to keep going. Okay, and so. Fives match, twos match, twos match, twos match. So essentially the 40s match. And then we have the three and the two that don't. So the least common multiple is going to be 40 times 2 times 3. And that's the 40 came from all of these going back together, <coughs> which is 80 times 3, which is 240 minutes. So in 240 minutes from 4 o'clock, they'll start at the same time again. So 240 minutes is how many hours? We have 4 hours because we divide by 60. So if we start at 4 p.m., we'll start again at the same time at 8 p.m.
Defining integers. What's an integer? It's all the natural numbers plus zero and all the negative numbers. Essentially, what you need to know about an integer is it's not a fraction and it's not a decimal. It's whole numbers and negatives and zero. Well, zero is a whole number. Okay. I don't remember what this is. I should probably pause first because I don't remember. Integers. See? All the negative, zero, and all the positive. Now, we haven't really talked about this yet. I mean, we talked about this. These are the natural numbers. And if you add zero, you get the whole numbers. And then if you add the negatives, you get integers. Positive integers is another name for the natural integers, and we can write them, or not, natural numbers. We can say plus sign, or we can have no plus sign. If you don't have a sign, it's positive. If you put a plus, it's positive. All right. Um, you guys have seen this before. The number line. Um, Zero is in the middle of the infinite number line if infinite can have a middle. And the positive numbers always go to the right, and the negative numbers always go to the left, which probably has something to do with the fact that they used to think that people that were left-handed were evil. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm going to go with it. Zero is not positive or negative. Okay. It's neutral. Graphing integers on a number line is very, very difficult. I find the number on the number line and I put a dot. Very hard. Actually, see, it was hard because that dot's way too small. Hold on. There. Okay, I go, okay, four, I find four, I put a dot. 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 Okay, you guys aren't all going to drop out of class now because I made this so hard, right? It is. It's incredibly complex. Um, on our graph, look, see, they're dots. They have dots. Dot there and a dot there. Anything on the right. Oops, too fat. Okay, so if your number is on the right, it's larger than the number on the left. If your number is on the left, it's smaller than the number on the right. So I can say that negative 4 is less than negative 1, or I can say that negative 1 is greater than negative 4. And to remember which way you want this to go, the arrow points the small number. And alligator mouth eats the bigger number. You guys all remember that one, right? The little teeth on there. So the mouth likes to eat the bigger number. And to remember on the negatives that the fact that they go backwards, think about money. And negatives are money you owe. So the bigger the negative, say negative 40 versus negative 5. Would you rather owe $40 or $5? $5, that makes it better, which makes it bigger. So if you have a hard time remembering that, that's how I do. Okay, um, we have inequality symbols. They always point to the lesser, like that. We just did that, so I was ahead of myself. Okay, so um, I want you guys to help me with this because, you know, I know you all know how to do it. Three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 
Okay, uh, we can combine it with an equal sign. If it has an equal sign, it can mean less than or equal to. So you can, if it's, if it's less than, it's true, and if it's equal than, it's true. So can or can't include the number. Strictly less than, like on this example, 9. 9 is less than 9, that is false. You have to have the equal for the numbers to be the same. So far, everybody cool with all this? And you remember all this and it's fine? Okay. Absolute value. Denoted by these two double bars. Okay. It is the distance from zero to whatever the number is. Now, if I go jogging and I run a mile like forward like a normal person, how far do I run? Okay. Now, if I go jogging and I run backwards, so in a negative direction, how far did I run? A mile. The distance is the same no matter if I'm running forwards or backwards. Distance is always positive, and since absolute value is distance, it can't be negative. You can't have negative distance. That's why when you drive your car backwards, the odometer doesn't go down, no matter how bad Ferris Bueller tried. Okay? You guys remember what I'm talking about? Yeah, okay, cool. So the absolute value of negative 3 is 3. The absolute value of 5 is? The absolute value of 0 is? 0. Absolute value is nice, yeah? Okay. Yeah, it's not opposite, it's just always positive. Yeah. Because the distances are those distances. Okay. Um, absolute value of 6? Negative 10? 0? 6? Negative 6, I mean? 9? Makes you feel like okay. adding integers. There's a bunch of different ways to remember how to add integers, but the rule is if your signs match, you add the numbers and keep the sign. Okay, so for example, two positives make a positive and two negatives make a negative. If your signs don't match, you subtract the numbers and keep the larger sign. So, for example, if I had negative 7 plus 5, 7 minus 5 is 2, but 7 is bigger, so negative 2. And if I have negative 3, whoops, not negative 3, 3 plus negative 6, do 3 minus 6, negative 3. Um, the reason I said modified number line, anybody? Um, Modified number line, zeros in the middle, your positives go up, negatives go down. Um, I think it's easier to remember to using this for adding. Positives go up, negatives go down is easier to remember than right and left. And so if I want to add, say, negative 7 and 5, I start at negative 7. Right, just here, and then 5 is positive, so I have to go up 5 and land at negative 2. So you can use a modified number line. Um, there's also visual picture things that you can do for modeling if you have trouble. Um, gather privately. But um, 5 and negative 18, separate signs, so I'm subtracting. Negative 6 and 10, again, opposite signs, so I'm subtracting. Negative 13 and negative 12, they're both negative, so I'm adding them. 18 and 23, 41, 
negative 32 and 6 is negative 26, and 19 plus negative 5 is 14. Now this is one of the properties of real numbers, additive inverses. An additive inverse has the same absolute value, but they're on opposite sides of zero, so basically they're just opposite numbers. Um, for example, 3 and negative 3 are additive inverses. And if you add them together, you get zero. That's what makes them the inverses. So, I guess I didn't put any examples in it. Good. 18 and negative 18, opposites, equal zero. 7 and negative 7. Okay, so basically, if you take any integer and it's out of the inverse, you always get 7. Or 0, not 7. Yeah, it's adding. It's just adding opposites. So adding opposites always cancel each other out. The big thing is, is you want to know that that's the additive inverse property because that kind of thing shows up on things like SATs, if anybody's planning to take those, or the PERT exam. Wait, you put this one. Subtraction being the opposite of addition, so you would do the opposite. So if I'm subtracting, I add the opposite. Um, Okay, so for example, 3 minus 5 is the same thing as 3 plus negative 5, which is negative 2. Um, negative 4 minus 7 is the same thing as negative 4 plus negative 7. Those are both negative, so I add them together and I get negative 11. 5 minus negative 2. This one, people have a hard time remembering, so I came up with my own little way to remember. Yeah, they make a positive, but see, look, he's a happy man. Little old happy man, smiling, he's happy. And happy is positive. Are you going to look like a little person, sir? Yeah. Um, I've also seen people do... They're like the giant plus kind of thing. And I've seen this one. Now remember though, if the front number is negative, that part doesn't change. The only part that changes is the double negative. Um, similar to in English, double negatives cancel each other out when you're speaking. If somebody were to say, I don't got none, for example, don't, negative, none, negative. If you don't got none, that means you have some. Think about it. Double negatives cancel each other out. When you're doing these, some people need to write them out like this. And some people don't. Do the way it makes sense to you. Um, just so you know that 7 is positive, 19 is negative, so I'm going to subtract and get negative 12. Here I have a negative 8 and a negative 10, so I'm going to add together and get negative 18. Positive 5, negative 14 gives me a negative 9. He's happy. So I get negative 19 and positive 21 to get a positive 3. He's happy. So I get 11 plus 6 to get a 17. Those are both negative. So I get a negative 17. And then this is just regular old subtraction that you're used to, that everybody's been used to for quite a while now. No, that's fine too. Oh, no excuse. Okay. 
Okay, so when you multiply, if you have the same sign, it's a matching game. You win! It's positive. If you have opposite signs, you lost. So it's negative. If you have an even number of negatives, So, for example, you have like a string of numbers that you're all multiplying together. Count up all the negatives. If it's even, you get a positive answer. And if you have an odd number of negatives, you get a negative answer. And the reason that works is because every time you have two numbers that have the same sign, they give you a positive. So if you have, take all your negatives and pair them up, each pair will give you a positive. If you have an odd number, you've got one left over at the end, and that gives you a negative. So, 3 times 6 is 18, and negative 3 times negative 6 is also 18. But 3 times negative 6 is going to be negative 18, and negative 3 times positive 6 will also be negative 18. And if I have 3 times negative 6 times negative 2, I have 2 negatives. So they make a positive, and that's going to be 36. But if I have negative 3 times negative 6 times negative 2, I have an odd number of negatives. So it'll be a negative 36. Real quick, positive or negative? We don't even have to multiply it out. Just tell me positive or negative. Positive or negative? Negative. Positive or negative? Zero. Not positive or negative. Can't have a negative zero. Um, exponents? Think of an exponent kind of like a Okay, that sounds weird. The exponent only acts on the thing it directly touches. Okay, so in this instance, between A and B, the parentheses put the negative and the 6 together, like they're holding hands. So, like they're holding hands and their hands are wet, and the 2 comes along and tases the 6, the negative gets tased as well. And so it acts on both of them. And so this one is negative 6 times negative 6. But when there's no parentheses, the exponent only touches the 6, and the negative's just standing there. So, like, if I came up to you and you were standing next to somebody and I tased you, they wouldn't get shocked, right, because you're not touching. So, this is a negative hanging out and a 6 times a 6. So, when the negative's inside the parentheses and this exponent is even, you get a positive answer. If there's no parentheses, it's going to be a negative answer. Okay. Next thing is that if the exponent is even and there's parentheses, you're going to get a positive answer. If the exponent is odd and there are parentheses, it's going to be a negative answer always. And that's because I'm going to have an odd number of negatives or an even number of negatives. So negative 5 to the thirds in parentheses is negative 5 times negative 5 times negative 5. Negative 2 to the fourth is negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2 times negative 2. So this odd exponent will give me a negative answer, an even exponent will give me a positive answer, and then you don't have to actually account for the negatives when you're doing the multiplication. You can just say, okay, this is odd, that's going to be negative, what's 5 times 5 times 5? Yeah, 5 times 5 is 25 times 5 is, yeah. 
And here I can say, okay, that's even. This is going to be positive, so I don't have to worry about that. And I can just say, okay, what's well, 2 times 2 times 2 times 2? This is 4, 8, 16. Okay, so just shortcuts for you so you don't have to do as much work. Order of operations, because I think that um, sometimes it's not taught quite clearly and people get confused and think that you have to do all the multiplication before you do the division. The order of operations has four stages or four levels of importance. And the top one is parentheses. But it's not just parentheses, it's any grouping symbol. And grouping symbols include, yeah, the long, like fraction bars, absolute value bars, brackets, braces, parentheses, square root symbols. Anything that groups a set of numbers together inside or underneath or on top of. Okay, then after that you have exponents. And then you have multiplication or division. <sighs> no, not again. Okay. This is in order from left to right. So as you read the problem, if you hit division first before you hit multiplication, then you do the division first. Division and multiplication carry the same weight. Uh, same thing with addition or subtraction. And I think that's the problem with a lot of the memory tools. You guys have heard PEMDAS or please excuse my dear Aunt Sally or both and each one of them puts multiplication and then division. Addition and then subtraction but that's not the order that you go in. Multiplication and division carry the same weight as do addition and subtraction. So the royal family of the order of operations is what I present to you. The parentheses are the king. So you have king parentheses. You have queen exponent. Very powerful, but not as powerful as king parentheses. You have the prince and princess multiplication and division. They're a prince and a princess. They have the same power because, you know, they're on the same kind of level of royalty. And then addition and subtraction are peasants. Okay, so the parentheses holds the most power, followed by the exponent. Multiplication and division are even, evenly powered. They're on the same like level of the royal hierarchy. And then the addition and subtraction is like whoever gets whatever's left over, the peasants. You know, they're down here. They're less important than anything. I have no parentheses. So the exponents come first, so 6 squared and 2 squared. So I get 36 minus 24 divided by 4 times 3 plus 1. Division comes before multiplication in this problem, so I'm going to divide first. So I get 36 minus 24 divided by 4 is 6 times 3 plus 1. Then multiplication, 36 minus 18 plus 1. Then subtraction, 18 plus 1. Addition, 19. Any questions on order of operations at all? Um, is this okay? Yes. Is this okay? No. Here's why. Okay, so if I said 6 divided by 3 is equal to 2, the reason this works is because 3 times 2 equals 6. 
Okay, I can divide 0. 0 divided by 8 equals 0 because 8 times 0 equals 0. It's okay. What I can't do is divide by 0 because 0 times what equals 8? Nothing, right? Because 0 times anything is always 0. So whenever you see this 0 in the denominator, your answer is undefined. And the reason it's undefined is because nothing exists. Or you could say no solution, if you prefer that. Or you could put DNE for does not exist. You could put the symbol for the empty set, because you guys have had set theory. Okay, So 0 on top or in front. OK. No problem. 0 on the bottom. Or behind, like it's behind a division sign, not okay. You cannot divide by zero.